This is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 84 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Marcus E. Acco, and we're going to be talking all about how to self-publish a graphic novel. I think this is a great topic because I don't often see uh, other podcasts talking about graphic novels, but of course, they're a huge part of the publishing industry. So I think it's always good to cover different topics that you don't always see on uh, these, you know, author (laughs) publishing uh, podcasts. So which actually, yeah, if you guys ever have a topic that you would particularly like either me personally to cover in a solo show, or you would like me to interview somebody, or if you have somebody you've always uh, wanted on, like to hear me talk to, or you've always just wanted to hear on a podcast, hey, just like, let me know. And I will do my best. I can't promise you I'll get them on but I can try so yes I just thought I would throw that out there all right last week's question was uh, what worries you about starting from zero Meg said what scares me about starting from zero with a new pen name is it not working it gets harder to do this year on year so far so good though but that's also the benefit of years of learning and practice to be able to hit the ground running in a new genre Cecily said I'm looking looking forward to listening such a wealth of information here Angelia said I was watching him on YouTube when I got notified of this (laughs) which is nice. Uh, Christina said, this episode is so fucking good. The info in it is gold. Thank you so much, Christina. Uh, Linda said, I liked when you said you quit doing things you didn't like, for example, Twitter, and started focusing on things you did enjoy, because I think that's so important, especially with social media, which is time consuming and a lot of the time just soul sucking. It also shows, it also usually shows Huh? Oh, so abandoning things that really don't bring you a joy is a win. I also liked when David said you can manage freeloaders in your onboarding sequence. I offer the option to unsubscribe in literally every single onboarding email. Um, what worries me about starting from zero? Well, I'm no longer at zero. I have four subscribers on my mailing list, but the sheer size of everything you need to learn and encompass. I'm looking forward to learning it all, but I'd be lying if I said I was, it wasn't daunting and that it doesn't make me go, what the fuck have you gotten yourself into now? Loved this episode. Thank you both so much. I think that's a great comment. Val said, building an audience is my biggest worry, or that I won't be able to find the right audience. I love David Gochran. Uh, Starting from zero was incredibly helpful, and I was laughing over him starting his nonfiction career out of spite. Uh, I also think that's hilarious. Uh, Yeah, and if you guys haven't gone and signed up for the starting from zero course, which is free, you really, really should. Even uh, like I have taken it. Uh, I've got, I think I'm about 70% of the way through. Um, I've got a couple more Uh, of the modules left to finish but yeah I am going to be finishing it before I release some of my other books later this year Kim Nash said oh I can't wait to catch up on this Amanda Howard said great episode and Lynn said uh, what worries me is all the steps between zero and where I'd like to be or even one It's a little overwhelming. I'd love the permission in this podcast to focus on writing before heavy marketing. Yeah, and like, this is the thing. It get it's so easy when there are really loud voices who are, you know, five, 10, 15 years into their career, or even they are naturally fast writers. And so even though they may not be five years into their career, they might be three years into their career with, you know, 30 or 40 books and therefore a backlist large enough to give them an income but the thing is we all do this at our own pace and you know it hasn't taken me (laughs) it's taken I mean it's, it's I haven't done this overnight this has taken me years years of writing I started writing with the intent to publish around 20 2013 I think early 2013 late 2012 early 2013 I think late 2012 I was thinking about it and doing starting reading and then 2013 is where I really put my foot on the pedal um 
yeah, around then. And then, you know, I didn't publish until 2017. So it was three or four years of writing and editing and re-editing and rewriting and learning. You know, I did a lot of learning about the industry before I hit publish. And so I suppose the reason it was only two years later that I then left my job, I think, is because there was such a big gap between deciding this is what I wanted to do and then actually hitting publish. Um, yeah, so I just, it does take time. You know, I've been doing this for, wait, oh my God, 21 now, eight years, fuck. <laughs> I've been writing with the intent to publish for eight years. Uh, so yeah, I just, just all I'm trying to say is this takes forever. You have time and you have time to learn. You don't have to do everything immediately. You don't have to know everything immediately. Just enjoy it. Like enjoy the ride. Yeah, enjoy the ride. Be present. Enjoy the moment because that's all we have when you get to the end. You know, the journey's over. And the whole, the whole, the whole thing is the journey because that product in your hand, like there's only one very brief fleeting second when you open that proof packet for the first time and then it's over like not that I'm trying to oh my god I'm getting into a whole can of words I just what I'm trying to say is just enjoy it <laughs> all right this week's question is do you read graphic novels and if yes what are your recommendations what graphic novels have you read that you have enjoyed or um perhaps the illustrations are amazing or perhaps the the story is amazing yeah let me know I have uh read and really enjoyed Wicked Divine, uh, which is by Kieran Gillen and a bunch of other people. And it has the devil in it, or like the devil incarnate in it. And it just, it, Lucifer was my favorite character. And yeah, I was, anyway, I don't want to spoil it for you, but I recommend that one. Which leads me very uh, rapidly onto the book recommendation of the week this week, which is How to Get Your Book Into Schools and Double Your Income with Volume Sales by David H. Hendrickson. I read this book oof, in like an afternoon. It's not it's not particularly long, but it is packed full of some really good ideas about how you may want to work with schools. And even if you don't want to work with schools, I think a lot of the principles are applicable to perhaps corporate. So if you write nonfiction, that may be uh, something that big corporate companies might like, then you may still find some benefit from this book. Um, I really want to have a uh, episode on this, but I'm actually waiting for uh, Karen Inglis. So she is at the Alliance of Independent Authors uh, children's book ambassador, children's book advisor, advisor, that's the word. <laughs> I should know this. Um, and she is bringing out a second edition of her book. So I am looking forward to that. I'm on the waiting list uh, and I will be reading that. And then hopefully uh, she will come on this podcast. I am going to ask her to. So <laughs> hopefully we'll have an episode on working with schools and marketing children's and young adult fiction. All right, in personal update then, uh, please don't forget the Rebel Author Diaries anthology submissions are now open. And if you would like to find out more information, the link is in the show notes or you can visit sashablack.co.uk forward slash rebel submissions. Uh, yeah, we are now approaching the last eight weeks for any submissions. So do make sure you get those in. This past week, I... <laughs> I've had a bit of a roller coaster week. I handed off side characters to my critique partners. I still feel like there are a couple of chapters that need a bit of work, but I got to the point where I opened the manuscript again after a three day, well, not a three day weekend, but sort of three day break from it. And I just couldn't do the edits. I didn't feel like I had the energy to do it. And I knew that that meant I just had to give it a, give it away, even though I wasn't quite comfortable. I didn't feel like I'd done it, done everything that I possibly could have. Um, and so, yeah, I really got very abusive with myself towards the end of the edits on that book. And I'm not proud of it. I just sunk into an absolute hole mentally. Uh, or telling myself it was shit, that I was rubbish, I couldn't write, nobody's going to be interested, um, you know, you're not going to teach anyone anything, all of this shite that is absolute crap. Um, but this is what we do. And I just, and I'm telling you because, 
you know, I want you to know that you're not alone when you do these things and when your brain is an asshole and tells you these things because our brains are assholes, believe me. Mine is a big, fat, juicy asshole. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I was feeling low, I would say, at the end of the edits. And this is why I don't really enjoy editing my own books because I'm just an absolute bitch to myself and it and it really grinds me down. Um, and I have to really bring myself back up again uh, in order to get ready for the launch and to remember why I loved writing the book and why I believe in the book. So yeah, I, I find that editing process really grueling. On the flip side of that, I managed to get the workbook edited very easily without any nonsense from my arseholic brain. Uh, so yeah, I have now finished the workbook and that has gone to the editor. I don't ever really send my workbooks to critique partners. I don't feel it's necessary. I send it to the editor and the editor is ex ex extremely good and will also um, check out, you know, if I've sort of left holes or anything. Uh, and I can leave a link to his uh, editing service, proofing service in the show notes. So I will do that. Um, and what else? Yeah. So next week I am going to be in the recording studio recording the villains workbook in my other podcast with Daniel Wilcox, Next Level Authors. Uh, we do a quarterly challenge and this time around I was absolutely determined to get my audiobook finished and if I don't get it finished there is a consequence. The consequence is you have to do the cinnamon challenge which is where you eat a spoon of cinnamon and I'm pretty sure everybody pukes and gags and it's horrendous and burns or whatever. So yeah I am not going to be doing that challenge. I am not going to fail. I will get my audiobook recorded. So that is what I will be doing next week whilst my book is with various different editors. So it felt like a really good time to go and get in the studio. And what else? I think that is probably it. Oh no, oh. Sasha has decided to add in a couple of other books. I, and do you know what? I'm not gonna talk about these. All I'm gonna say is I have added in two other books into this tax year's uh, like, workload, product production schedule. I don't know how I'm going to get them done, but I'm pretty fucking determined to do it. So yeah, I've also been making some really big decisions in like my business life and personal life. I'm not ready to talk about them just yet, but it will, it, I think there is a difference between you know, making a decision and making a decision. And sometimes when you make a decision, I feel like those decisions have a tangible quality. This decision will change the direction of my business. And um, it felt like everything slotted into place as soon as I made the decision. And, and I thought I had already made this decision, um, but I clearly hadn't because when I then made that decision, like I said, that feeling came over me and I realized that I had been clinging onto the thing like a security blanket. And yeah, so now I need to, I always feel like also once you make that decision and you have told the universe the thing that you want to happen, it then, it then like opens doors and moves things out of your way. You just have to do the work to uh, manifest it. I don't want to get too woo woo. Uh, but you know, I really do feel like that sometimes when you, when you, decide these things and then you take action upon it shit happens you know maybe, maybe I'm maybe that's privilege talking I don't know but um yeah I I do feel like sometimes there is a I know anyway I made a decision which I will talk about later and I genuinely feel like that decision happened as a result of me doing that annual review it was genuinely eye-opening for me I didn't realize quite how significant of a shift um things had 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 over the last year both financially mindset wise business wise structure business structure wise so many things have changed and I am so grateful that I stopped and reviewed and 
if you take one thing away from this podcast episode, which, you know, other than what's coming in the, in the graphic novel section, it's to do an annual review. Even if you are not quite published yet, even if you only have one book, please just stop and look at where you were a year ago and where you are today, because you might surprise yourself with how much things have grown and changed. All right, I have been banging on for quite a while. I think we should get on with the rest of the episode. <laughs> The Rebel of the Week this week is Yanni Jade. This is quite a long story, so I don't know that I can shorten it. I'm, I'm trying, I, I will try and uh, shorten it a little bit because I have already banged on enough for you guys and I'm sure you just want to get into the interview, but this is a corker. All right, Yanni says, in it was Halloween a couple of years ago. We always decorate the office and complex. So just to explain, Yanni works uh, at like a big sort of holiday camp type place. Uh, and we try to outdo the last year's decorations. This time around, the theme was a witch's cove. So we spent weeks making signs, posters, covering the walls in cobwebs. And I even painted a mural on the wall uh, of, of a stone window frame with the silhouette of a werewolf, werewolf? <laughs> a silhouette of a werewolf hound uh, howling at the moon on a hilltop. One morning, one of our guests came into the office rather distressed, wishing to make a complaint about the Halloween decorations and one sign in particular. Taking it all rather seriously, I asked her which sign it was that offended her. She said, a witch lives here. I know it's the time of year, but I don't appreciate all this Wiccan decoration. For me as a person, I feel I cannot enter this building with that sign on the door. I believe that there is more behind these simple signs. It's a shame that all the youngsters today are taught about Wiccan magic and not about Jesus because witches are evil. Staying up until the early hours praying for terrible things. <laughs> what? I can't even read this seriously. Praying for terrible things to happen. Kidnapping children. <laughs> okay. I Sorry, guys, I will get through this. Kidnapping children and summoning the devil. Oh, my goodness me. She began breathing heavily and teared up. Anyone knows me, knows my face said what my mouth could not. My colleagues, colleagues all smirked in their seats, watching how I dealt with this lady. Knowing I follow certain traits from Wiccan teachings, knowing full well that it's all about balance and within nature and within yourself, inner peace and law of attraction and the universe. Bearing in mind, I was also wearing a witch costume at this moment in time, putting my personal feelings to her rant aside, I tried to reason with her by saying, they are only printed decorations for the children. I can assure you a witch doesn't live here. It is purely a decoration. I understand that, she said, but I would still like you to remove them. I can't walk to the restaurant without feeling attacked. Attacked by a sign. Oh my goodness me. So I said to her, I will speak with the department that put them up put them up, and ask them to remove them as it would be unfair of me to rip down something they took the time to make for children and left it at that. However, an hour later, she came back in, this time with her husband, as, he, as she was still very upset over all the Halloween decorations, and she started crying. She explained how it made, she made it to the lounge and had to perform a cleansing to banish the bad spirits. Uh, and then Yanni adds some narration saying, are you guys making the same face as me? Because that sounds suspiciously like witchcraft to me. Okay, so... Yanni continues, we'd taken down the sign that upset her, but there were uh, more with a similar notion throughout the complex. She came back to me since I was the one she'd spoken with before. This time I sat at my desk with my pentagram and triple goddess tattoos on my wrists fully on show. Her husband saw them before she did and smiled at me. He didn't have the same beliefs as his wife and said, I think she complained to the wrong person, don't you? Quite. Eventually, my manager came out and told her in a very frank and it is what it is manner that the, this year's theme is a witch's cove. I suggest that if this upsets you, you remain in your holiday home away from its influence as it will be up for the remaining two weeks of the children's holiday. Flash forward to the following year, ready to welcome her back. You're damn right I dressed up as a witch again. This time taking it one step further and drew... <laughs> and drew sigils and symbols all over my arms, chest, face. I put deeply gothic eye makeup on with red eyes and a beautiful dress and hat. She, she came into the office, took one look at me and promptly left. I don't know what her problem was. <laughs> oh, God. 
Oh, I love this. I love this so much. <laughs> Oh, this has made my day. I'm literally crying. I've got tears crying, crawling out of my eyeballs. Oh, if you guys would like to be the Rebel of the Week, and listen, I am starting to run low on rebellions, so please, I am asking you, I want to continue these Rebel stories every week, so please do send me in your Rebel stories. You can email me at rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com or Instagram me at Sasha Black Author. And on the email, I do reply to every single email, but I am incredibly slow at replying at the moment, or just in general. I'm just, I'm just useless when it comes to email. However, I do reply even if it takes me a month. Um, but if you reply, if you email me a rebel story, I'm sure I'm gonna reply sooner because I am running low, like I said. Thank you, Yanni, for that hilarious story. Two new patrons this week. Welcome and a huge thank you to Shelley Sarah and Stephanie Johnson. Of course, a gigantic thank you to all of my existing patrons. If you would like to support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, as well as bonus content, uh, like my Poison and Prose, Patreon Poison and Prose, and that one's going to be the middle Wednesday of May, which I believe is the 12th of May. And also... <laughs> One of my patrons has asked me to record a sort of verbal whiplashing in order to encourage everybody to uh, get on with their work. So I will be delivering that very soon as well. So yeah, you can get a ton of bonus weird, weird things, lovely things, uh, verbal beatings, if you like, uh, by becoming a patron. So you can do that by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. All right, a monster intro this week, but uh, hopefully you enjoyed those stories and my random wafflings for the week. All right, let's talk to Marcus. Hello and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today I'm joined by Marcus E. Akko. Marcus is a filmmaker, radio show host, podcaster, YouTuber and now published author. Through his production company, Eight Foot Ants Productions, his debut novel is Call 1-800-KILLER-GUY, the first in a three-book arc series from the crime neo-noir graphic novel series, Culliver City Chronicles. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha, for, for having me. And, and I figured, you know, it's it's only fair because you came onto my show on at the Idiot and Writer's Block. You're one of my most featured experts on that channel. So uh, I, I, I was like, it's only fair I give you the opportunity to ask me questions. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming on. So tell everyone a little bit about you and how you got to where you are today. Okay. Um, I started off mainly wanting to become an actor. Um, I moved from Nigeria in 96 when I was about 14. I came to this country and the only thing I wanted to do was act and do films. So I did a lot of theater growing up, went to university, did theater while I was there, got on the old Vic stage. And then my main love was movies. I started jumping into doing movies and just trying to freestyle getting myself into the industry. Uh, and I was almost there. I even, you know, ended up having the radio show, which is on Resonance FM, which is talking movies and so on and so forth, called Shoot the Breeze. And I was literally set up to, to make my first feature film in 2020, which was Pull Out Couch, and then COVID happened. And because that shut down absolutely everything, I had no idea what I was going to do. So I, I didn't want to just go stale. I didn't want to just, you know effectively die that horrible death where there's something that you want to do and you can't do it because the world is telling you you can't. And so I figured, you know what, one thing I've always wanted to do, and I've always said I'll do it when everything else is settled, is write a book. So I figured I'd jump out and start writing a book, but I didn't know how to do so. And I went on YouTube. Uh, I found uh, Meg Latour's uh, channel, uh, I Write Italy, and I loved it. Um, and it was through that I achieved found out about you as well uh, Sasha Black and 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 your work and your podcast and so I was listening to you listening to Meg getting ideas on how to write a book and at the same time I tried to write a, a graphic novel ages ago but again it just I was like you know prioritize put it down put it down and then now that COVID hit and there was nothing else to do I was like okay I'm now learning how to write a book um, that's what I'm going to do I'm going to try and channel in that direction and then I figured, why not try and get the graphic novel off the ground again? And that's basically where I ended up. So since June 2020 uh, was the point where the YouTube channel pretty much sprung up, where I asked experts to help me 
learn how to write my books uh, to this point where I'm now going to be publishing the first in my graphic novel series, Color of a City, which is called 1-800-KILLER-GUY, book mm. one. So yeah, that's pretty much how I got from there to here. Amazing. So like one of the things that I am really interested in is the key differences when writing a graphic novel versus writing a novel, because I do read graphic novels. I love um, Kieran Gillen. I don't know if you know who Kieran Gillen is. He writes the um, Wicked Divine series and Ah, the Die Die series as well. So he's definitely um, my favorite, although I have read a few different things. Um, And like, I don't, well, obviously I spend a lot of my time writing about and talking about and thinking about craft mm. and I don't understand how you write a graphic novel so is it like a short story like what how do you write a graphic novel okay so um this is one of those things where it's like when you when you know it it's difficult to explain it to somebody else because you have to conceptualize something that you know that they understand um for me i i'd I'd say first of all you start off with what type of graphic novel is it that you're trying to do so there you know like anything like any book you have short story you make you give the example of short stories you can have short stories novellas etc um graphic novels are similar in that regards where you could have you could go down the, the the route of short story graphic novels right where each story each you know there's a compact story that's there or you could have long you know series of books just the same as a novel the way i pretty much approach graphic novel writing is uh, it, rather than writing a novel i approach it the way of storyboarding your own script so again i started off from a film background so i wanted to make films and instead of uh, you know so with this particular graphic novel what i did was i just took an idea said right write out the story and how would that story appear on screen? And I storyboarded it. So it's essentially, you write the novel, you write the story, you storyboard it, and then you pay more attention to the visuals than you do to sort of flowery description or purple prose, if you will. You can still include purple prose in narration and the way the characters, uh, you know, converse amongst each other, but there isn't that much that you'd have to do with regards to description of things. So that's how I would basically say the key difference between graphic novels and actual literary novels. The fact that you're going to be visualizing every single inch of the panel. Uh, With regards to constructing the story, it's like any other story. Like I Mm -hmm. said, you could do, I'll give you examples. Um, My my influence when it comes to the graphic novels is Frank Miller uh, and uh, Brian uh, Azzarello, uh, Ed Brubaker, Sean Phillips. I'll be talking a lot uh, about them in a second. Um, So there's Frank Miller, for example, his is more, uh, you know, a collection of short stories set in that city, in Sin City, right? Um, So you have in Basin City. So you have different people having their own adventures and then he compiles all of that into one book. Whereas with something like Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips' Criminal, he has multiple books, but each book is focused on a group of people and you follow that pulp story Mm -hmm. from beginning to end in that one book. So it's all, all depending on what method you want to take. So when you say storyboarding, does that mean when you wrote the graphic novel, you literally like wrote it in squares and drew the pictures around it? Is that what storyboarding is? I mean, I, like talk to like I'm so naive about this process. Not a problem. I can I, I'm, I'm happy to talk about this all day. I know you, you don't have that much time, so I'll, I'll be concise. So you're, you're absolutely right with storyboarding. So um, storyboarding, when it comes to film, essentially is you get a script and the director and the people who are working on it visualize each scene. So when you, each snapshot that you see on screen, that's basically how they visualize it. And then they try to sketch out what it would look like when they then eventually put it on screen. Now, with each block, you will have, and different storyboards have different sort of structures, but the main idea is that you'll have that panel, square or rectangular panel, that is the visual depiction of what's going to be there. And then on the side, you have um, your description. So it's sort of like the the scene name or identifier, then a description of what's happening in the scene. You can be as detailed or as concise as you want to be. And then if there's dialogue, you can often put that dialogue in there. And the same, and the difference between 
um, graphic novels and actual storyboarding is with storyboarding for movies, you don't need to draw the speech bubbles coming out of the characters' mouths. With graphic novels, on the other hand, you do because that in itself has a placement on how it appears on screen or on the page. So that is something else that you, you do as well. So do you have to be good at drawing to, as a writer to do this? Only if you want to be the one that does absolutely everything. Uh, so I am I, I famously my drawing skills uh, was described as the that of a five year old <laughs> who's half blind. So uh, <laughs> so that's basically. But that's, but I storyboarded everything myself. I did ev- and even my own films. I storyboard everything, even though it's terrible. What I do is I spend ages trying to get it done to a point where if I show it to somebody you can identify that that's a human that I'm drawing. That is as that is the base level I get to. I like, do you recognize that this person is a, is a guy and this person is a girl? Yeah, now that you say it, yes, now I recognize that. That's basically how far I get. Um, but that's, the, the, that's a good thing that I'm not the one illustrating this. Mm-hmm. I, the reason why I do it that way is, and it kind of comes down to my process as well. So the process of writing my graphic novel, the way I did it was literally come up with the story first. I get the idea of the story, all the beats, dialogue, et cetera. Then I write the script so that I can fine tune the dialogue itself and fine tune the interaction between the people. Then I move on to badly illustrating the graphic novel. So I go through and trust me, I have, if when I get, I say when, if I get famous and people are interested in my work, I still keep copies of the illustrations. You can see how bad it is. Um, but I try. So that's, so that's all that counts. So I do that. I do a badly, I, I do a bad illustration of what it's supposed to look like. Mm-hmm. And then I present it to the, then I start writing up the, the, you know, the panel description. So as we talked about on the side of each panel, you will have uh, the, the description, the what's happening in there and references and so on and so forth. And then I give all of that information to my illustrators who then make it look far more beautiful than I can ever imagine. Now, the benefit, you could use certain software to do that. Uh, Celtics is the one I use. I'm sure there are plenty of other pieces of software out there. I, I mentioned Celtics because you can get free programs on it that you can still mm. work with. That's a script I, writing software, isn't it? I heard that um, it, talked about the other day, actually, funnily enough. Yes, it is. And they also have, when you go onto it, it has options for scripts, for radio plays, and for uh, for comic books. So what okay. it actually does... Sorry, how do you spell it? No, I was just going to say, just for listeners, how do you spell that? I believe I believe it's C-E-L-T-X. I believe that's what it is. C-E-L-T-X. Uh, and they're great. I've been using... I, I started using them since, what, uh, to 2008. And I've been using them nonstop. I know you have Final Draft and a whole bunch of other options, but it's one of those kind of things where you find your favorite TV show and mm. you stick with it and so mm. on. That's basically, that I'm like, you know, whatever for its faults and whatnot, I'm sticking with them. And I use them constant for e- all, everything I do. Um, so yeah, so they have a program where, uh, you you know, it's allowing you to actually put, you don't have to uh, uh, put all of the descriptions and everything onto that panel. You just focus on typing up the script. So the script is formatted in a way where all you need to put is just the descriptions and the dialogue. And then you can have a separate document for your illustrations. And that's what I did. So what I did was literally I took pieces, I took blank pieces of paper. I drew the lines of the panels myself, how I wanted to appear. I drew all the illustrations, all the pages, everything else. And then I used another uh, com. It was, I think, Comic Pro, I believe it, it's now, it was an old, the old Mac books and whatnot, but I don't think it's on the, the new ones. It's not on my new one anyway. Um, and I use that. So basically you scan those images, you put them on there and then you can put in like dialogue boxes and everything else. So with my illustrations, I didn't put the dialogue boxes in there, but I knew where I wanted them to be. When I scanned it and put it on, on the Mac, I could then pull dialogue boxes and type into those dialogue boxes what I wanted the definition, you know, the, the dialogue to actually be and arrange dialogue boxes to, to appear in certain ways. So that's how pretty much I worked. I, I know different people have different methods. Uh, Neil Gaiman on his, on, uh, in a masterclass, he, he pretty much works in, the same, in a similar fashion. He does the story. So for Sandman, for example, he does the story. Uh, and, you know, does the script and everything else. And he also does tiny little illustrations that he would give to the illustrators. But obviously he's Neil Gaiman and he's got tons of people that he 
worked for centuries on illustration, so he doesn't have to tell them how to cook eggs. Um, or is that, is, what's that expression? How to how to suck eggs? That's the expression. He doesn't have to teach them how to do that. However, he used stick men illustrations to do his. So he doesn't put any effort into what it is. He's just basically saying this stick man you see is lying on the floor. That's all he does. I, on the other hand, I go through, I put a lot of effort into into doing it badly. Uh, but yeah, I still do that just because I want to be able to make it as easy for the illustrators as possible. And that was the feedback I got from every illustrator that I worked with on this project, trying to get it to fruition. They've all, always mentioned that, which is the reason why I stuck with that method. The fact that it made their jobs a lot easier because they could they could read the description look at my illustrations and immediately understand exactly what it is I'm trying to capture. And that is what will help when it comes to speed of actually getting the work done. Because once you can, you know, get that com communication between yourself and the illustrators, that just solves a whole lot of issues. Because the last thing you want to have happen is you describe a panel that says, Sasha walks into the room and points a gun at this guy's face and says a quippy line and then blows his head off. And then you send Sounds it like off me. thinking, yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> and then you you expect it to be something like that. And then the person, because it's that whole thing where uh, I heard this expression a very long time ago, um, and I, I'm going to butcher it, but you know, a happy rhino in my head is not the same as a happy rhino in your head, right? Mm -hmm. So it, unless you can pick, you can give them that picture of that happy rhino, they will draw a completely different happy rhino. Mm -hmm. I've managed to avoid that because of the technique I use. Mm -hmm. So you've talked about, um, I guess, like the process that you use in terms of you storyboard, you create the dialogue, write the script with sort of added descriptions on uh, and, and do the illustrations. Talk listeners through the process that happens next. So obviously you need to work with a illustrator, like what happens um, just overarching from okay, you've done your bit of the, the story and creation, then what? How do, you, how do you get a beautifully illustrated, finished graphic novel? Okay. Uh, do you want me to talk about how I got my illustrators as well? Or is that going to be a question that you want to um, ask afterwards? Because I can, I can talk about that afterwards. That's fine. Yeah. No, yeah. Throw that in. Okay. Fair enough. So um, for me, the way it worked is um, once I've done everything I need to do and I start looking for my illustrators, uh, as soon as I found my illustrators, it, it's that communication process, right? So you then, first of all, pitch the idea to them. You explain the influences behind what it is you're trying to do, uh, the style that you want it to, you know, to come across, the tone you want it to come across. Uh, if you have any visual elements to be able to represent or like a picture board, a mood board, if you will, to be able to represent what it is you want to come across, that helps a lot. So that's what I do. I spend that time, that those first few days, if you will, just talking to the illustrator. And before I even pick my illustrator, I look at what they've done before. Mm. Because again, you'll have illustrators with different, with different variety of work. You know, a manga illustrator is not what I'm looking for. Um, you know, it's completely different. Somebody who does uh, indie art type illustrations might be fantastic, but that's not the type of art style I'm going for. So that's another thing that you need to consider. So not only are you considering, oh, I mean, it all depends on what the project is that you're trying to do. Some people might have an idea for a graphic novel, but they don't really care about what style it comes out in. That's dangerous. Yeah, that it's is dangerous. dangerous. Yeah, it's absolutely dangerous because, you know, your style, the story you're trying to tell, it needs to all mesh, right? And you don't know yeah. what's going to happen. And I yeah. think readers of graphic novels are super fussy, or at least I know I am. So like, I don't read manga and I don't mm -hmm. like, um, so this is the interesting thing. So I don't like black and white um, graphic novels, but your graphic novel, despite only having like black, white, red and a band of yellow, mm -hmm. um, is not like the black and white type graphic novels that I'm thinking of. You know, the ones I'm thinking of are those more old school, I almost want to say like, like pen and ink line type oh, yeah. graphic novels. Whereas this is very much like, I want to say it's like full color, even though it's not full color illustrations. I don't know what is the term that describes a style of art because yours is uh, much closer to the, the Kieran Gillen style artwork. 
um not that he's not he's the writer i think not the artist anyway um then it is like your traditional old school black and white like beano type style comic no absolutely no i I know exactly what you mean um and uh, i'll put it this way if if anyone's a fan of uh frank miller's sin city yeah uh, graphic novels then you would love this one because it is essentially the it it is what conceived this idea i i I first read uh the first sin city books i I mean i first watched the movie the robert rodriguez movie and then i was like oh it's just based on a on a graphic novel so i went and found the graphic novels and i just fell into that rabbit hole and i bought all of the copies of of Frank Miller's work and that was that's effectively the influence that is just dotted around this as well as the others like 100 bullets and so on and so forth but I understand exactly what you mean when you think about black and white uh, graphic novels you're essentially looking at just that style which is just it is mainly trying to just depict that image and just say look don't even worry about the art itself just worry about what you just focus on the dialogue on the story and so on and so forth that is fine. That is a different style. With, with my style of graphic novel, I wanted it to be literally, again, similar to, to Sin City, where you could literally pick up the graphic novel and use that as something that you can shoot as a film, right? So, you, mm. you know, it, it's already mm. done. So that's how I visualized everything. And the use of color as well is that that is, if you're, if, if you're great with color, then that's fantastic. I'm not. I had ideas of where I wanted the color to be, but I just said to the illustrators, Sublime Studio, that they are fantastic. Um, I said to them, look, I have, I would like it to be with splashes of color. Yes, focus mainly on the blacks and the whites because it's it's a neo-noir, gritty neo-noir. So you want to go like, you know, the detective, hard-boiled detective mm-hmm. style uh, route, right? However, you need that injection of color at various points. And they said, don't worry, dude, we got you. And what they came out with, I was like, I, there was no point where I said, no, 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 this, there's no color here. They got exactly what I meant because with every single scene that, you know, with the description and what was happening in the scene, they knew where to throw the reds or the yellows at various points. And we scaled it back so we didn't have too many colors so that when the color pops up, you know, it's a, it's a good scene that's coming. You know, the reason it's impactful, if you mm. will. It really so, yeah. is. I have to say it is stunning. Like Thank you, you, you Thank really you outdid much. yourself because oh. I, you no, know, no, I, I am really fussy about um, graphic novels and like my eyes bugged wide when I opened it. I was like, dang on, this is beautiful. So, I, I, yeah, I you, don't know you how really, good that makes me feel. Uh, <laughs> no, you're, well, you're welcome. Yeah, I, 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 I love those pops of colours and I think they really, they really do do exactly what you've just said, which is to give um, that impact. So, like, what is the hardest element for you, do you think, of uh, mastering? And, like, I I mean the craft of creating um, a graphic novel. Is it the dialogue? Is it the, you know, getting that balance of direction? Or, I don't know, like, what is the hardest part of of the craft? It's very easy to point out what the hardest part is. And the hardest part is the structure of the panels. Because... Again, going back to the different style of graphic novel that you want to work with, if you want to talk about just regular style comic books or like you mentioned Bino, right? The Bino style comic books. They usually have a structure to mm. every single, uh, you know, magazine or, ep- or issue that they have. It's a single. And if you look at all the Snoopy comics, it's all the strip panels. So it's always the same. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, when you, you're now v- venturing out with something like a graphic novel or even comic books these days, um, and not just these days from, you know, like the, the Marvel and the DC. Yeah, they're the ones who are taking over the industry, but there are other Im- um, sort of like image comics and so on who use the structure of each panel to be able to tell the story in such an impactful manner. And the structure of panels in your on your page is a completely different language on its own. So you mentioned dialogue, right? You mentioned description and so on. There are elements of that where, yes, you know how you can put dialogue, but if you hear bad dialogue, it, it, you know, for people who don't necessarily care about it, it, it just goes right over their head. But for people who really focus on dialogue, it's when, when you hear it, it's coarse. It pulls you out, right? That's the same thing with the panels on the, on the page. 
it is its own language that while you can just blag it and just say, you know what, I'll just do whatever I want to do. Somebody who's interested, who knows about it, when they see a scene and it's in a small panel or it's, you know, or it's too large and it's nothing really there, it, it's jarring. It's really, really jarring. So that is the hardest element to nail when it comes down to graphic novels. One of my favorite uh, things with the panels is when one of them spills out into another one. Like, I mm -hmm. love that when they do that. And I don't think I ever realized that I loved that until you literally just talked about the panels because they probably subconsciously, no, consciously passed me by, but subconsciously, I was definitely paying attention to them because I could tell you immediately the thing that I love most is when you have, you know, like a leg kick out or whatever, there's an explosion that billows over into like three different panels or whatever. So yeah, I think that, yeah. Um, Absolutely. A... And it's, it's similar to, it's similar to film, right? I mean, again, it's, it's all, it's a visual medium. Uh, and there was, again, I can't remember who said this in particular, but they said the best, the best editing in a movie is when you don't notice the editing mm -hmm. and you've just said it yourself, right? You didn't really notice that it was the panels that was doing it, mm -hmm. but you know, if you were to remember, what is it? You, as you, as you described it as well, one panel overlaps with the other. And it, if you do that for every single page, it's, you know, the impact is lost. Mm -hmm. And there are also, so, there's some, and there's some pages in the book as well, where the entire page is just one image, mm -hmm. right? And that needs to stand out. When do you do that? Do you do that too often? The ones where you have the repeating patterns and so on. Uh, there, and that is all. Uh, I, I did a lot of uh, when I was doing my when I was doing the illustrations. I did a lot of research uh, in in structure of panels. I didn't do as much. And if those of you who know me, those people who know me, I am an idiot for a reason because I I do a little bit of research here and I go and try something out. I do it badly and I come back and I'm like, okay, so that didn't work. What did I do wrong? And I try to do research and I try to fix it and I make another mistake, but at least I make a mistake that's better and then carry on from there. So I did that research as well into the structure of panels, finding out ideas of how to do when repetition works and when repetition doesn't work and so on. So that was basically the hardest part for me. It was the hardest part to learn, but for me, it was the most joyful part to learn. And it's because I'm a very visual person. So when I saw the rules, it's kind of like, it's the whole idea. The best way I can put it is when you eventually can see the matrix, right? So it's sort of, it looks beautiful and you get the understanding and you say, oh, that's the reason why that works that way. And that's why it's so impactful. And you just say, I can't, I can't, this is a new toy. I can't wait to play with this. And that for me, while it was the hardest part to learn, it was the most joyful for me to learn to do this. So in your book, you have book in your graphic novel, um, <laughs> you have a fight scene where it's more or less only illustration with a couple of sound effects. Yes. Now, I know you've mentioned like that you storyboard, but how do you then create that like in conjunction with the illustrators? Did you have to like... Obviously, in most novels, at the climax, there's you know usually a fight scene or something that happens. In a lot of fantasy books, there'll be some big battle, or whatever. Did you have to like write out the battle, or like how does that work? How do you create a battle scene with no words? How does that work? How do you create story with no words? <laughs> and that that for me was actually the easiest part because so so as I mentioned at the start. You know, I wanted to, I wanted, I, I, because of COVID and because of the lockdown and everything, I decided to move in from film to start writing books, but I didn't know how to write a novel. I mean, you think it's easy, but it's not. I've read your books. I've read your, uh, some of the, you know, the how-to books that you've done with, you know, writing a great protagonist and, and character words, et cetera. And I had to learn that to be able to make a good product and i have something coming out at the end of the year which is just a novel it's not a graphic novel but again that's adapting it from a script i'd written so that's kind of cheating but anyway um so when it came is to it writing though? the graphic well, you got the I'll, book done it's not cheating I know. <laughs> I know i know some people are like yeah you didn't come up from scratch and write that as a novel i don't know I, i'm stepping into the world of a novelist i'm a novice in the world of writing novels and as such i think it's one of those things where in my opinion, anyway, not in my opinion, I have this insecurity that I'm stepping into a world where there are tons of experts who spent decades honing their craft. And I'm just this one guy, just this idiot walking through and saying, excuse me, excuse me. Hi, here's my novel. And, and you know, uh, we are that's all just that, that person. I always feel like the, the little girl walking into a room with huge 
people who I've idolized for years. Like we all, we all have that. Like you, you are not alone at all. I know, I know, and I, 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 I can understand that, and that's, but that's how I feel about it. But anyway, coming back to to the uh, the question about the um, the action and mm. and the fight scenes. Um, so again, because I illustrated it right for me, that was the easiest part to do because uh, it, it, trying to draw it out and, and doing it badly. I still was able to depict, okay, th- in this panel, this is where I wanted, I'll describe this one particular fight scene in where this character, Seamus Teague, I just imagine Terry Crews, right? Big black guy with an Irish name. And he's one of my favorite characters in, in, in the book. Um, and so he comes in and he meets this drug dealer and he's there to kill the drug dealer. The whole book is about the hitman community in this in this city. And it's how he begins and it's how he actually initiates the attack with this umbrella that he opens is pre-prepared and so on. And then he jumps over, he takes the uh, the handle off the, uh, the umbrella itself. And then he goes and he bashes the guy to death with it. Now, try writing that in the description. Again, the visualization just based on the description is going to be different from what you're thinking of. But the fact that I could illustrate it and I could r- draw out exactly what I wanted, his looming presence as he's walking towards the table and then how he skips over the table, I drew all of those so that it helped with the description. So when the illustrators looked at it, they came back. Every every time the illustrators came back with a draft, they didn't hit a, they didn't miss a beat. It was exactly how I wanted it to be. Okay, fair enough, fine tuning a little bit, but it pretty much was exactly what I wanted. Even with the sound effects, with the sound effects themselves, I drew all of that. So I actually, in the panels, when I drew that, you know, the guy hits him with the, with the uh, stem of the umbrella and you hear the cracking sound. I just visualized if I was watching this in a movie, what would I hear at that point? And I'd hear a crack of the bones breaking. I'd hear, you know, the thump of his head as it hits the, the back of the ground. Obviously, it's a, it's a comic. No one's going to hear that. So you have to describe that somehow. Where would the sound come from? So I just, I would write thud or crack, you know, I, I, where I think that sound would emanate from. I drew all of that on the illustrations. So, and I'll include that in the descriptions, just saying the sound crack here, you know, here at this point and so on. Because I've drawn that on the uh, storyboard that I've given to the illustrators, they knew exactly where I wanted it to be. And they would then ha- add their own flex to it because obviously I'm terrible at it, but they, that's their job. They know what to do. So the style of the way it flows and the way the sound is supposed to move, they know how to do that. So I would just, write in this is where i want the sound effect to appear and they would know how to draw that sound effect based on what is creating that sound and that's where they then work on it okay so i'm going to wrap a couple of questions together now okay so okay. how do the story arcs work with a graphic novel do they work better as a standalone or um in a series and and a patron cassie says um, she's curious about serials um, as an indie author as well. Is it a model um, that you see much of or is it primarily through traditional comics? Hi, Cassie. Thank you very much for your question. Um, it, again, it's similar to what I mentioned earlier, it all depends on what it is you're trying to do. Uh, if you say what works best, it all depends on what it is you're going for. Um, for people who are starting off, and I interviewed Neil Gibson, who is from T-Pubs, uh, it, it, it's a it, they're, they're an independent publishing company based in the UK. They do gr- great graphic novels as well, and there's is, a lot of their work is anthologies, right? So short stories all packed up into into one graphic novel. So, with regards to the graphic novel scene, and as an indie graphic novelist, um, the idea of doing short stories probably works on a number of levels because you can do multiple stories and you can put it into one book or you could do multiple short stories and you can release them on avenues like Patreon or uh, or, or Webtoons if you can to be able to elicit uh, interest on your own website. You can do those small short stories. People look at the visuals. They love the quick storytell- you know, storytelling devices that you use and it's quick to be able to get to it, right? You, you look at it, three pages, done. There's this one uh, panel on Instagram called Three Panel Crime uh, and they just post and it's three panels. Uh, it's, a, it's a story, it's a crime scene, three short panels and that's it. 
that is good for an indie uh, publisher or indie artist, indie author to be able to get yourself known. And then you can then start building it and building it and have one graphic novel. Um, but that's not the only way you could do it. You could use your story arc and just basically do it like a regular novel. Just say, look, this is a regular novel, but it has pictures, right? That you address it that way and you could do your entire story in one book. I know tons of books that are like that, tons of graphic novels that are like that. I mentioned uh, Ed Brubaker's Criminal. It was like that. Uh, my style with this particular graphic novel, uh, I'm, I'm going to use... Uh, Culver City Chronicles as like my home base, if you will, it, it, where, because I'm planning on doing different types of novels, um, where all the stuff that's to do with graphic novels will be focused on this one city, Culver City. Um, and my idea is the sense that I'm going to have these three books, which are called 1 800 Killer Guy, and they're three books in that story arc. So it's going to be one story across three different books. And then I'm going to have an anthology. Uh, you know, of stories, which is going to be still set in the same city, but all short stories about different characters. And you have all the various characters like Seamus Teague and a whole bunch of other ones in these books, all into, you know, interacting amongst each other and so on. I, it's a, it's a, it's massive in scale in what I want to do, but I know I'm building gradually and I'm doing it gradually by doing this first book, which the structure of this first book, when you're reading it, I don't, I don't know if I want to say this, if it's going to be like a spoiler for people who are, who are going to read it, uh, but it does seem like it's all short stories, but it's not. I'll, that's all I'll say. It's not short stories. This is just for this first book. And then the second book will be slightly different. And the third book will then be a culmination of the three story arc. So with regards to how you want to do it, I would say just get your plan first. Have an idea as to what it is you want with your graphic novel. If you just want your graphic novel to be something just to tell one short story, then that's fine. You can do it as a short story. I wouldn't go as far as saying do it as a graphic novel. Maybe do it as, uh, as you know, what you can post on Patreon to get people interested in it. And then if you want to carry down that medium, you know, carry on in that medium, then have another graphic story. Maybe have a theme that connects all of it together to, to make one larger book. But it all depends on what it is you're trying to tell. Are you going to bind them all up at the end into a volume? Because I don't, I can't remember what they're called now, but you know, like when they're monthly or weekly and they come out like the individual ones. Periodicals, yeah. Periodicals, that's it. I, I always wait and buy the whole volume when it's done so that I can just read through the whole thing. Sure. I, yes, I do plan to do that. Um, oh, cool. And that's the thing with with book one, book one works um, as a, as a standalone book, if you just mm. want to, if you say you just want to pick book one and that's it, and never go step you know step your toe in in the city anymore, that's fine. It still works as a standalone book um, with the hook that you will then lead you to book two and book three. Yeah, book it's a two, very good hook. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> so book two and book three, uh, book book two obviously is you know is part of the chunk, and it'll be quicker when you get those ones in there. But absolutely, the moment I've done book three and book three is out for a while. I will then do uh, an edition where it's all three, all in one massive, massive volume. Yes. Okay. So um, we've talked a little bit about like the illustrations and the process. Um, are there like what, I mean, a couple of questions here, like what are the key considerations you need to make when working with an illustrator? And then I suppose alongside that, I, you know, I, I know nobody really likes talking about money and I don't want you to tell me exact figures or anything, but can you give listeners even like a ballpark range? Because I don't think I have any idea what it would cost to, I, mean, I know what it costs to produce a book, but I don't have yeah. no idea what it costs to produce um, like a graphic novel. So yeah, can you give us like some kind of idea of those c considerations? Okay, um, let, let's start off with the pricing consideration and then I'll move on to other considerations with regards to, uh, you know, uh, mapping out to publications. So with regards to pricing and essentially, first of all, if you're going to be having, if you're going to have someone else who's illustrating it for you, because when it comes to the illustration side of things, there are actually multiple routes in illustration or multiple roles in the illustration. There's the, the uh, illustrators, then you have the colorists, then you have the letterers. So those are three separate roles. When, it, when we talk about illustration, you have three separate roles that actually fall under that category. So you could potentially have a situation where you need to hire three separate people to do those jobs. So there is that that you need to keep in mind as well. With regards to pricing, 
uh, the, the, what you would find and what I found anyway, and there could be other people who found different, but what I found as an indie author is that the price range I was getting was between 50 pounds, because I'm in the UK, 50 pounds per page. So between 50 to 300, I was quoted at one point to do everything. So that's 300 pounds per page. I didn't go down that route. Oh, okay, that, I, I didn't. And one thing that I had with this particular project is luck because mine fell in the range of 75 pounds per page. Mm. Uh, working with Sublime Studio, I found them on freelancer.com. They have the, uh, their, their tag on freelancer.com is at Stower, S-T-O-W-E-R. As much work I can throw to these guys as possible, I will. I'm planning, essentially, I, I, in my head, I've told them this, but they don't believe me. I'm planning on just working with them for as long as I can on this graphic novel series because they are excellent. They are excellent workers on there and they're a team as well. So with regards to the, those different roles, they all have people within their team that do each one. And as such, they were able to price me in the uh, lower range, so the cheaper range than the others who were quoting 300 for the entire thing. Now, I'm sorry, so just oh, to interrupt, I suppose you also have to pay for an edit as well. Uh, yes, yeah, so absolutely. If you if you want to do the the editing process as well, I consider that as everything before getting okay. to the illustration, right? Yeah, so you've yeah. got your story, so you've got all that stuff first. So if you, yeah, if you want to talk about the regular side of things, absolutely. I'm if you want to look at actually doing the edit afterwards, including the illustrations, after the illustrations are done, I would say that's probably a little too late. Mm. If you've already paid for someone to do your illustrations and then you want to go to an editor and say, here you go, then the problem with that is you've already paid a lot to then have somebody tell you, well, your story arc is not right or this character is not that great. And then you have to go and redo everything again. Mm -hmm. If you're going to go down the editor route, I didn't, I didn't have an editor for mine. I, I'd, I worked on the project and I, that might be hubris on my part, but I think I tell the story well. Um, it, I knows? can't use a comma, so I'd never be able to uh, <laughs> get away with not having an editor. <laughs> But, and that's the thing. That's the thing, right? So with the with with okay. So I see what you, your point with regards to the with you know copyright editing, you know commas and punctuation and so on. Sometimes you know you might catch it when you're reading the book. You're like, oh, okay, fair enough. I said she when I meant them or something along those lines. Uh, but uh, which I did catch actually. Um, but after the illustration was done, but. I would say get all of that stuff done before it hits the illustrators, because once it hits the illustrators and you then have to get them to redo your work, that's going to cost you a lot of money. Mm. What? And I appreciate I'm jumping all over the place. Uh, no, but this is very, very style. interesting to me. Um, where does the copyright lie for those images? So the copyright lies in the contract that you have with the illustrators. So, uh, and freelancer.com are great with that. That website is basically, it's like a Craigslist, if you will, uh, to be able to connect you with different illustrators who would work on your project. So what they do is they have packages where they can say, look, if you want to come with us, what we'll do is we'll, you give us your proposal, what it is you're trying to do, what your budget range is. We'll put it out to this level of, uh, of you know, artists or freelancers and so on. And when you finally paired up with the person that you want to work with, they will draft the contract for you, which basically says you and only you have sole um, rights over the work. So they are work for hire, if you will. Um, and that's how that's how it goes. So they will produce the actual contract. And that is essentially, if, if you're not using freelancer, if you're going to Illustrators Direct, that's what I would say you should discuss with the illustrators before they before you even give them your work, right? Yeah, your your sketches and your diagrams, etc. Um, because you want to establish own ownership first. Mm -hmm. You want them. You want the understanding to be that what they're doing is they're doing it's work for hire. That whatever illustrations they do will all be yours at the end of it. That is very very important because if you don't do that, then later on when you want to try and publish they have every right to be able to say, well, no, this is my work and they can put it wherever they want to put it, which mm -hmm. becomes problematic if you want to keep it a secret, right? Imagine you want to do a cover reveal and you're saying, okay, I'm going to spend three weeks prepping social media and then two days before you do that cover reveal, 
somebody says, hey, this looks like the book that you were telling me about. And you go and see on Pinterest and you see the cover. That doesn't work. You need that contract before they begin the work that's clear, that states clearly that your ownership is yours, not mm-hmm. theirs. Um, so I appreciate we are starting to get near the end, which is such a shame because I there are so many questions I want to ask. <laughs> um, okay, so another patron question. Have you ever adapted a novel into graphic novel formats? No, I haven't. Um, the, well, they've I, adapted I, a screenplay into a novel. <laughs> I have, I have, yes. So, so I've adapted, but it's my screenplay, so it's it's good. I adapted my screenplay into a novel, which is a, it's um, a an a, a family or uh, middle grade adventure, uh, which is coming out later on in the in the year. Um, would you go the I other ha- way? Would I would I go the other way? As in, yeah. So, would adapt- you adapt Culliver into a novel series? I yeah, to be honest, actually, I did have I did I had the idea to adapt it into a film series. Um, to adapt it into a novel series, I wouldn't say no to that. Um, it's not something that I'm planning on doing at any point, but it is not something that if the opportunity were to arise, I'd say no to because mm. at the end of the day, it it's all there. All I'd have to do is literally just describe what's on the page. Mm-hmm. And, and I've got all the dialogue. I've got the script. I can just copy and paste. So that's it fine. It would make for an amazing novella series, I think. What, you think? Oh, I well, think so, it, yeah. There we go. I'm banking that idea. And uh, <laughs> it, it's it's my idea now. So yeah. I, know, um, I, I, don't have, I don't have any plans at the moment to novelize uh, the Culver City Chronicles just yet. Mm-hmm. But that's because we're just starting out. So we'll see how we go five years from now, if it's a case where um, people, there's a lot of interest in the stories, I may decide to open it up. Um, I, I, there is there is definitely a, uh, a game plan. There's a roadmap that I have, which basically is going to, Culver City Chronicles uh, and the stories from Culver City Chronicles will eventually end up on screen. So there is already a roadmap towards getting a, a film done on all of these projects. Um, with regards to the novelization of them, not yet, um, but now that you've given me that idea, I'm quite happy to do that if the call, if there's a call for it later on. So uh, one last question before I ask the ultimate question. Um, sure. Logistically, how, how do you format print, you know, that distribution stuff? Is it the same way you do a book? Do you just go through Amazon or KDP or Ingram Spark? Like, how does that work? Okay, so I am going through uh, Amazon. I'm going through uh, Draft to Digital. I'm going through uh, Ingram Spark as well. So, on, on at a high level, yes, it is the same. Uh, but when you get down to the details, absolutely not. Mm. Um, the reason why is, and I'm uh, with the ebook. The ebook is actually was actually far easier to get done. And this is a key thing that if any of anybody is interested in going into it. Um, when you're discussing what you're expecting your illustrators to come up with and what you're expecting the design team to come up with, you need to include the various versions and you need to include that early on in the negotiation. Because if you, like I did, um, remember to do that at the end or you only re, you know think about doing that at the end. And luckily, again, Sublime Studio are the best. They didn't charge me anything extra for it. They just said, hey, don't worry. It's all good. It's on us. We'll do all the different versions that you want. Um, so I, I fully understand how another group of artists could have quite rightly said, no, the original agreement was to do one version. We've given you that one version. You have to pay extra for this. Mm-hmm. They didn't do that for me. They just said, look, we love the project idea. We're happy to be on board. We'll do as many versions as you want. Just let us know when and we'll get it done. Um, so I had them do a version, for, an ebook version, a web version and a print version. Uh, because that's how I want to do it. Get a paperback uh, out there and the ebook version. The ebook version, very easy, got done, and it's pretty much ready. It's it's it was ready to go out from you know the, the moment they delivered. The print version, on the other hand, that's the bit that was problematic as uh, as hell. I can swear on this, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> it was problematic as fuck. So it was just it was literally I had to go through. It, it, essentially, uh, when you go through. Um, through Amazon, they have their specifications, and it's not just—it's not just a case of, you know, the measurements of the trim size or whatever. It is also how the lettering is going to be appear on the page. It's also the, the you know, if it's going to bleed over in various areas. And myself and the illustrators, we worked through tons of iterations where we'd go, we'd put it on there, and they would 
print a copy and then send it back to us and say, no, it's, it's not good. You need to do it again. So I've had to go through multiple iterations on, or on a draft of digital, don't do print, not yet anyway. Uh, but Ingram Spark and Amazon had those two issues in particular. I when, think draft to digital is in beta for print. Yes, they are. And I haven't gone in that direction with them because I figured, you know what, and they were the easiest to work on with regards to everything else. Um, e the ebook with Ingram Spark, they kept coming back with, no, it's not working. It's not working. It's not working. And so I just decided, you know what? Okay, fine. Amazon already taking care of ebook. So a draft of digital. So I'm gonna, just going to do ebook with those two and Ingram Spark and Amazon will handle the printing side of things. Yeah, and that's what, I'm, I'm, I know it was a pain in the ass for you, but I'm actually glad that you said that because I don't, I absolutely love Ingram Spark for paper. Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. for ebook. I don't recommend anybody goes uh, with Ingram for ebook. And that's not a slur on them. I, I have all my hardbacks on my paperbacks with Ingram Spark. I love them. Uh, but I, I personally uh, always recommend that people go direct to as many of the uh, distributors as possible. So I go direct to um, Amazon, Apple, Kobo, Barnes and Noble, Google, and then I use draft to digital for everything else. But yeah, uh, cool. sorry. Cool. No, no, it's, it's, thank you for that. Um, but you, you're absolutely right because I, for a second, I thought it was just, it was me. No, <laughs> no, they're, they're, it's yeah. not you. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you're, so Ingram Spark are handling the uh, handling printing. So Amazon um, with regards to Apple, I'm going through draft, uh, draft to digital to handle, uh, um, to handle Apple and, uh, and everything else, Barnes and Noble, et cetera, through them. Uh, I haven't gone through Google, which is a good point, which, which you know, I, I'm going to see how things go. Uh, mm -hmm. It's mainly because of all the various projects that I'm juggling at the moment that I'm, I, I, I want to try and consolidate, um, you know, control over mm -hmm. where it goes, which is why I'm doing that for the next book depending on the success of this one. So if all of you guys go and make this one really, really successful, I'm going to be like, excellent. And I'll go everywhere. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But uh, yeah. Are you going to so, sell direct? Uh, if I can, I will. I, it's not at, It's not the plan yet, uh, but I want to see how things go. I'm new. Like I said, I'm new to the business um, and you know, I'm happy to take advice from various people like yourself as well so whenever you're free to give me some advice on how how to how to do how to expand a lot you know a lot further i'd be happy to take that on board like i said i'll do everything i'll make mistakes i'll go back try and you know make my mistakes but make them better so i'm happy to take as much advice as possible okay this is the rebel author podcast so tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel so uh, that when I when I hear that question that you ask on the podcast, I always I try to think when do I not release my inner rebel? So I'll I'll, I'll stick it to being an author. Um, and the thing with unleashing inner rebel, from my understanding, is just where everyone else tells you no, you shouldn't, and you just go screw you, I'm doing it. Uh, and I'd say it's to it's the YouTube channel that's the start because again when COVID happened. It was a case where it's like all my film projects basically got shelved. Um, and uh, it's like, look, you know, I could have easily just said, forget it. I'm not doing that anymore. And I did feel that way for a point and for a day. And I felt so, uh, I felt so devastated that that would be something I would even consider. And that's when the idea of writing the novel came into my head. And I was like, you know what, how about we do that? And then I thought, Mimi, go to YouTube channel first or go to YouTube and learn how to do that. And Meg Latour on Ira Ashley, I can't recommend her enough. I, you know, she, she's beginning to tell me to stop uh, saying as much stuff about her, but any, any opportunity I can, I'll talk about her because she gave me that inspiration to just go in. And one of the things that she said in one of the videos I watched was, you know, it's a, you know, it's a great way to do it. Set up a YouTube channel. At least you start an audience and it starts to build. So by the time you have your product, your product is there with, no matter how small the audience is, at least you have an audience. And so, and I had never done a YouTube channel before. And I figured this is it. I'm, I'm going to do this. So I just said, forget what's going on. I don't care how much work I have. I'm just going to knuckle down and get that done. The YouTube channel started, I met people like yourself uh, and a whole bunch of other people who came on the channel to give me advice on how to work. And I, I just charged right through it, even though, again, mentioning it to my family and saying, hey, I'm thinking of doing a YouTube channel. And everyone was like, really? Uh, no. So I was like, I I'd say that 
is for me when it comes to being a rebel author is my uh, is is my me unleashing being a rebel author mm, lovely can you tell everyone uh, where they can find out more about you your graphic novels and anything else you'd like to add Okay, so um, with Draft, going with Draft Digital, they made it very, very simple for like the ebook distribution, right? So um, if anybody wants to find the ebook copy of Call 1 800 Killer Guy, just go to books to, with the number two, books to read.com slash call 1 800 Killer Guy. And they give you a whole bunch of links to Amazon and Barnes and Noble, whichever your your favorite option is. That is basically how you can get that for the book. You can go on Amazon, search "Call One Eight Hundred Killer Guy," and the book pops up there. To follow me and all my work, you can go to uh, the production uh, uh, webpage, which is Eight Foot Ants. That's eight, the number eight, F T, and then Ants Production. So Eight Foot Ants Productions dot com. And to follow me on Twitter, you can either follow me with the YouTube channel, uh, you know, I on writer's block. So at I on writer's block on all, you know, all social media platforms on YouTube, just type in the idiot and writer's block and you will find me. Or if you just want to follow my antics on Twitter, it's at Marcus underscore Akko. I don't talk too much on there. I just repost other people's stuff and mention some stuff. I'm more, um, I'm more active on the I on writer's block on both Twitter and Instagram as well. So yeah, those are the main areas you can find me. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much for having me. And thanks guys for all the questions that you asked. Uh, and yes, keep listening to, to Sasha Black's podcast. I think she's, she's awesome. She's doing the Lord's work, helping idiots like me be able to get my book up and running. Thank you uh, also to all of the show's patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, uh, then you can do so by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. And thank you, of course, to everybody listening. My name's Sasha Black. You were listening to Marcus E. Akko, and this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Next week, I am joined by Christina Adams, and oh, I loved talking to Christina. She was such a sweetie, and we talk all about how mindset can actually improve your craft, so that is a very interesting uh, a conversation, and so I hope you'll join me next week for that. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review.